My name is Mary Lloyd Ireland, and I'm going to talk about sex and sports, caring for the female athlete with ACL injuries. There are special considerations in reconstruction techniques because she might be shorter, and also concerns about normalization of gait after a reconstruction is done. I'll share some examples with you. These cases will be the short patient, a failed ACL reconstruction in a non-anatomic tunnel position. Females may be smaller, but you can still get the tunnel in the right position. Development of osteoarthritis in a professional basketball athlete following an ACL reconstruction. Arthritis, unfortunately, does occur. Gait abnormalities are really times when the gait is not as normal as we would think, even though they're cleared to do sports at seven and 10 months following their ACL reconstruction, and sex differences. Surgical management, graft choice, there really should be no sex difference in deciding this. Don't change based on cosmetic concerns. Don't change based on what the parents want what the coach may have told the patient. Do what is best in your hands and don't do an allograft in a young person, male or female, since there's a greater failure rate, at least in 2016. But particularly in the female athlete, don't compromise stability of the knee for a bigger scar. It's what's on the inside that's most important, and that's a stable knee. Some pearls, smaller, shorter patients. That's a female patient sometime. You must adjust the femoral fixation. Also have different fixation choices, such as a suspension, such as a button, end a button, or biabsorbable devices. And avoid iatrogenic IT band syndrome. That is, the screw pierces the IT band going through the lateral femoral condyle. So think about these pearls and special consideration. You gotta adjust the femoral fixation. I do use absorbable screws in shorter patients, such as 5'5 five, five or less height. This is a 16-year-old soccer athlete. I used bone patellar tendon bone autograft this is the arthroscopic picture at the time of her fixation. I have no declaration or disclosure of any type screws. I use this trailblazer, then a wire, and put this cannulated screw. The screw was 7 by 20 millimeters, titanium. Her height was 5'2", her weight 106. The position, I don't use x-ray at the time, the position of the tunnel on the femur looked good. Nice back wall, very posterior. Fixation was good. Post-op x-rays obtained. The post-op x-rays, AP lateral view, show the screw to be prominent through the lateral cortex, spear chucking the IT band. I couldn't feel that at the time of surgery, but now I do try to palpate that and in somebody that's 5'2", I would use either a bio interference screw or some type of a suspension fixation such as an endo button. I would use what I am used to in my own hands and not experiment with other devices that may be harder to get out. So our x-rays two weeks after her ACL, talked to the family and the plan was to see how she did. Unfortunately, that screw did indeed bother her. She couldn't really return to running and cutting activities. Didn't want to take it out too soon. So I waited for nine months and removed the screw through a small IT band splitting approach, getting the screw out that way, screwing it retrograde, reversing the direction of the screwdriver when I was unscrewing it. 
What does this look like arthroscopically? So I did do a scope at the time of her hardware removal. Here's her graft. Here's her notch. And you can't really see the femoral attachment at all. The graft looked good as far as the tautness of the graft. No cyclops lesion. Menisci look normal. So you can't really see the screw intraarticularly. I usually put it in a fair way so it's not prominent and make sure that the screw and plug are well paralleling. Graft probing looked intact. So at the time of arthroscopy, looking in the lateral gutter, you can't really see the screw. It's higher up. And an open removal of the femoral screw over the IT band. There was a thick bursa around it. And screw removal was reverse thread at 9 to 10 months post ACL reconstruction. Her knee was stable, but her IT band was unhappy for a while and was much happier after the metal screw was removed. Iatrogenic IT band syndrome. Avoid it if you can. Her two week after hardware removal x-rays are shown. No interference screw in the femur. No longer needed. Very happy patient. Stable knee. A cure for IT band syndrome. This patient is a failed ACL reconstruction of her left knee. I saw her 18 months after she underwent hamstring autograft. She was a Division I prospect. She played a year in a brace. When we see these individuals come in, we always question why did it fail? When did it fail? Was it ever stable? Did it fail because of tunnel placement? These questions are really unknown since now I'm starting to see her 18 months after her original surgery. She had a hamstring autograft performed. Biabsorbable fixation was used. This shows her revision, which I did. Tunnels and below are her tunnels prior to surgery. I made some red tunnel marks here because it's difficult to see without fixation there. And this is a soft tissue hamstring autograft. But the amazing thing to me is this is where her tunnel is on the tibia. And it's so far posterior, it is at the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. It's a little hard to see where the femoral tunnel was. There is lucency here, which is of concern, particularly tibial lucency is of concern, and you have to stage the grafts, stage the reconstruction sometime. On the femoral side, if it's not your own, oftentimes the tunnel is in a position that is different, and you can change the position of the femur where you go more short or more inferior using inside out or outside in techniques. So if you look at where my tunnels are, totally avoided the tibial tunnel. I saw where it was soft. And then I made a very acute angle here to avoid this. You can actually see that previous tunnel a little bit better, and I could see it at the time of surgery. So this is where my new second ream tunnels are. This is her arthroscopic finding of her medial meniscus had been sutured. This is her fluffy, doesn't work ACL. And the shaver is at the level of her tibial tunnel. Unfortunately, her posterior root required repair. Again, this is 18 months after her original surgery. Placing all inside fixation, both on the femoral side and the tibial side, was necessary. This is taking out the stump of her incompetent ACL. And now I'm feeling on the femoral side where the tunnel was, and it looks like it might be up at about 1 o'clock. Totally avoided her tibial tunnel because it was so far posterior. And in this case, I reamed outside to in to avoid the femoral previous tunnel. You can use this ruler to tell what your 
depth is so you can make sure your fixation is of the correct length and isn't prominent if you're using interference fixation. This is teasing the graft up. I used her own bone patellar tendon ipsilateral and post ACL reconstruction she is stable. She hasn't start playing basketball at one year after her revision but she desires to. Okay, that's good. I think we just went through. Do we just go through that yeah. once, maybe? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, ready? Next case is a 36-year-old female, professional basketball athlete, who started playing basketball about age 10. She tore her ACL on her right knee. I had seen her previously for patellofemoral osteoarthritis of this knee, so you can see where she does have cystic change in patellofemoral osteoarthritis. This was the knee that she injured. She underwent allograft ACL reconstruction I did not perform a reconstruction. She really had not had any previous problems with this knee until she tore ACL at age 36. This is her x-ray two years after ACL reconstruction. You can see that she has tricompartment osteoarthritis. These are weight-bearing films. Her left knee that had the patellofemoral osteoarthritis doesn't look too bad. So she now has progressive tricompartment osteoarthritis, stable knee, she's stiff and she hurts, now age 38. She has stopped playing basketball after having a 28-year career in basketball. Here she is three and a half years post-op with increasing knee pain, further loss of motion. She did have some symptomatic loose bodies. So should we be thinking about a concept of pack years, as in pack years of smoking, the additive effects of years of participation in basketball? Maybe we can have too many pack years of basketball. It would be nice to have some registries of how many hours, days, months you play basketball to better know what accumulative loads there are on the knee and the body. Counseling patients on not playing if their knee is swollen, they have an unstable knee. Physicians should be more proactive in counseling patients on the risks and benefits of any sport. But after an ACL reconstruction, unfortunately, arthritis is very common. Even up to 50% of patients who undergo ACL reconstructions or even in those who don't. Is the risk higher in those reconstructed or not reconstructed? More registry long-term outcome studies are necessary. In our gate lab at the University of Kentucky, Brian Noren and his co-workers have been doing some amazing gait analysis, strength testing, and movement patterns on our injured athletes at six to 12 months, they're cleared oftentimes to return to sport. But when we really analyze their gait, it is pretty shocking what that involved side really looks like when you drill down and do strength tests, balance, and particularly gait analysis. This individual is 12 months following her right ACL reconstruction. We've got the lines on her, the yellow is her involved side. You can see where we have overlaid a pelvis. Her trunk is forward. She has a Trendelenburg when she lands. On her left side, her right hip drops, her right iliac crest drops, an active dynamic Trendelenburg. She has a difference in flexion range of motion, loss at her hip and at her knee that is significant. So she has a stable knee with good passive and active range of motion, but when you put her on a treadmill, her gait abnormalities are significant. If we allow her to go back and play soccer, she's at risk for loading that right knee in an abnormal way, which may create osteoarthritis. 
and she also is at risk for perhaps not being strong enough or trusting the right knee and injuring something else like her left ACL. These are her numbers 12 months following right ACL reconstruction. There are differences in her knee extension. The normal is 45 degrees. She has eight less degrees of knee extension than her opposite side. But even the opposite side may not be normal. Looking at hip adduction, the normal is 16 degrees. On her involved right side, significant increase in hip adduction at 23 degrees compared with 12 degrees on her left side. This is another individual who's seven months after her right ACL reconstruction. She was cleared for full soccer activities. Look at her pelvis forward tilt. Her trunk is forward and she has a Trendelenburg. Similar to the other individual, she may appear when we examine her in the office to have a normal knee, but when you really start looking at the gait, again, that superimposed pelvis from the back, when she lands on the left, there's a drop of her right hemipelvis. Landing on the other side, it's much more level, so negative Trendelenburg. On the left, positive on the right. Definitely abnormal gait running pattern, which would lead to abnormal loads across the knee. So if we look at her numbers, on the right, her knee extension is 40 compared to 58 on the opposite side, so an 18 degree difference, less knee flexion. Think about the mechanics of what's going through the joint with that less range of motion by 18 degrees at the knee. And then up at the hip, very important for lower extremity position, less by 3 degrees in this individual, 15 compared to 8 degrees, a deduction. It's very important to analyze gait, look at balance and strength to determine if an athlete is ready to go back or if they should go back to the sport where they were injured. And the question is, what do we compare? Do we compare a normal control to the ACL injured leg? Do we compare the ACL reconstructed injured leg to the uninjured leg? Is the uninjured leg actually normal? Studies that we've done do show differences in the uninjured leg and the normal control. Objective measurements done of the hip, trunk, balance, and gait. When we put athletes through these tests, determining return to play or even for prevention, what did these functional tests really tell us? They tell the patient that they're not ready to go back to play or they are ready to go back to play. What are the best tests to do? This is something that you should talk to your rehab team about, your prevention team about. Pick things that you can have the athletes do. They'll follow through and do them. And make your own battery of tests based on basic science studies like the University of Kentucky and others are doing. I think we really need to continue to go upstream and look at the trunk Side bending can be differences in angles in early stance. Hip angles can be normal, but perhaps it's the trunk where there's a greater ipsilateral trunk lean in these individuals that have torn their ACL. Trunk control tests are less well known, and I think we need to be innovative and make sure that these tests are normalized. 
This is a unique trunk control test where they're sitting on a ball. The command is to put one foot down and remain stable on the ball. She had test errors where she would put her other foot down, more so on her ACL injured side, but also on her opposite side, and there were significantly greater control test errors. In other words, she was much more out of control with her trunk on the ACL and the opposite side. And when we looked at controls, they were much less at 3.4 compared to 5.8 on the opposite or the normal side, uninjured side, and 7.1 on the ACL side. So these are some trunk control tests that are being developed that you should look out for and maybe utilize them in your clinic. Yes, females are different in the confidence code in sports and reflections. Katie K and this BBC CBS this morning talks about the confidence code. We have this idea that if we keep our heads down and we play by the rules and we're just good girls, our natural talents will be rewarded. And then we've watched as the guys have got promoted over us mm -hmm. and pay rises over us. And actually, I think women need to redefine talent to include confidence. Mm -hmm. It's an important part of the game for us. Mm -hmm. And you talk about tips for boosting confidence. Fail fast when in doubt. Act. Don't ruminate. Rewire. We talked about that. And it's not personal. And in terms of raising our girls, very important. I think we need to start this idea that girls have to be good girls. You and I have no. spoken about this, you, Gail. You said encourage them to be less good, encourage them to be a little bad. That a was such a contradiction bad. to me. You know, girls are brought up always to be good, and they get rewarded for being good. And then, you know, to ask for that pay raise or to go for that promotion, you have to be prepared to rock the boat. You can't people please all you the mean, time. prepared to take the risk or to be bad? Prepared what does to be take bad the mean? risk and to fail. To, you have to be prepared to stick your neck out a bit, yeah. to do things that may not make every single person in the room happy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important lesson for our girls and something that we parents can pass on to them. And maybe we men can learn. Uh, yes, and I have specifically for you, Charlie, a confidence test <laughs> I'm not on our tests. website. <laughs> and I want to know the results later. So any athlete must be prepared to fail, particularly female athletes. Get out there and compete, and hopefully you'll win and do well and not fail but you don't know about failure unless you get out there and compete. Encourage our young athletes, male or female, to participate and compete. Female and male sports are certainly different, as in this pairs figure skater and wrestling. The landing patterns are different. How they touch each other are different. The goals are different but they're competing and they're athletes. Differences are good and differences do occur in female and male sports. There also are differences in the way the mirror talks to us, differences in men and women, but difference is good and that's what makes the world go around. Thank you for your attention.